<clears throat> okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Dr. Shani Wheeler. Um, I am a soil and water scientist by training. I come from the field of pedometrics, so use of point observations of soil in space and time in relation of those to Earth observations and other covariates with a model to make outputs. Um, we'll go deeper into that in a little bit, but I'm going to talk about AI for Soil Health project. Um, this has just been funded under the European Union's Horizon program. Uh, there are 28 partners, seven of those are in the UK or Switzerland. Thank goodness we could carry our UK partners with us. It was a bit touch and go for a while. Um, and then the others are spread across Europe and it's very much a concentration um, of both really hardcore soil science, so very heavy soil scientists and also geospatial technologists. Uh, with a very interesting backdrop of uh, new legislation and a bit of geopolitics. So uh, it's, it's, so it's an upcoming project. It's officially started beginning of this year. It runs for four years. So basically the, the entire objective so is to create open access European-wide digital infrastructure with AI information. Do you want me to stop? I think we're having sound issues with AI, in, sorry, AI intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence methods. I just copied this straight from the proposal and I will make fun of it in a moment. Uh, with new and deep soil health understanding and measures. I hope you can see what we did there. So what I'm gonna talk about is just a quick project overview. I'm really just gonna talk about um, AI tech for environmental management and soil health. Uh, and then the, a bit more about the geopolitical context that this project um, has been conceived and will be executed in, because it's, it's interesting is probably the way to put it. So uh, I will start with this. Uh, yeah, so dear Michael Jordan, um, stop calling everything AI, right? So it, it's right. He's very right. But, um, you know, a lot of people like the term AI. We think, yeah, the machine is gonna tell us what to do. And we kind of trust machines quite a lot, right? I don't know why, but we do. But it's really true that what we have to actually focus on is building actual scaled machine learning based systems that actually work, that deliver value to people and don't amplify inequalities, right? So really we should have probably called it machine learning for soil health, but that's just not as sexy. So we called it AI for soil health, shamelessly. So I, I was... Also AI. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a discussion. So I did a search going, okay, what, what this rabbit hole that got me, what actually is artificial intelligence? And it was an was interesting time. So I'm like, is Google search an artificial intelligence? I don't know, I'm just a soil scientist. Right? What do I know about this stuff? So according to Reddit, technically, no, it's absolutely not. And I'm like, okay, well, Reddit usually knows these things. Google, however, itself says search is a form of narrow AI, as is predictive analytics or virtual assistants. So it's AI, but it's not AI. It's narrow AI. I'm like, okay, AI for soil health is a form of narrow AI as is predictive analytics or virtual assistants, right? Whoops, what have I done? Uh, accidentally turned it off. Which is a machine learning based system that hopefully works, delivers real value to humans and doesn't amplify inequalities. That's a project in a nutshell and I'm still gonna call it AI for soil health, shamelessly, narrow AI, like Google. Okay, what does that actually mean? Like for soil, what are you doing applying these like concepts to soil, right? So if there are any soil scientists in the room, they'll probably disagree with me, but that's okay. That's what we do. We're very good at it. So soil survey is the state of the art. Most of it was done in 50s and 60s. It literally is people training very long time uh, with a lot of like expert knowledge between people in particular areas and going out and actually classifying soil. Okay, so you're like, the human is the model. 
basically. There's a huge amount of knowledge created in making these. A lot of farmers, land advisors do this process themselves already, whether they know or not. They're experts. They, when they see it, they know what it is. They may not be able to tell you why, or you know, it may be a bit, their knowledge may be biased to particular areas and not others, so it's not transferable, but it's real practice knowledge. So along comes digital soil mapping or predictive soil mapping, and now we're taking these points, these profile measurements, which do get taken in this method, but obviously not that many, yes? And then the human transfers the knowledge. So now we chuck it in and we take all these covariates, things that people look at, where is it in the slope, what is the climate that I'm in, what is like the general landform around me, what's the vegetation, these soil forming factors. We chuck some models on it and we want to predict soil properties. Right? Here's the 3D predictions. So this is like geostatistics moving into machine learning from about the late 80s to 2020s, let's say. So it's about more a data-driven approach. I know I'm mincing words a little bit here, but then we're going to go into AI from the 2000s on to the infinite future and decisions beyond coded and trained, aware machine. Of course, it's not true. Um, so really, replacing human decisions in soil health, it's sci-fi, okay? It's not real. Um, so we aim to try to get an unbiased aid of human decision-making, and there's no Skynet or SoilNet here, no. So it's a decision aid within what is coded and trained uh, for the system, but one of the interesting things for the system that we really like to explore is actually how do you connect those experts that were doing this type of work with the models in their minds, how do you connect them to this kind of output? So you're kind of like the machine augments the human and then the human can make better decisions. Narrow AI, right? So let's go to the other controversial thing in the name because we basically took two fairly controversial topics and just slapped them together because that'll be fun, won't it? What is soil health? Um, so if there's a soil scientist, are there any soil scientists in here? Hands, no. One, yes. Okay, you save your questions for after. But um, hands up if you think this is a healthy soil. Okay, hands up if you think this is a healthy one. No hands, no, no, no thought. Is this healthy? Why are the bottles different sides? Okay, that's confusing, but these are both soils adjacent soil samples, and these are adjacent soil samples, okay? Different treatments, let's say. These two are a pair, everything the same except for something. Is that healthy? Yes. Hand up, yes? Okay. Is this one healthy? It depends on what's the solution. <laughs> yes. So, okay. There is no right, purely right answer to this question, right? So somebody who works in the field who is, let's say, a soil health practitioner will very quickly say, this is an unhealthy state for soil to be in, okay? If it's not a particular type of slaking, like dispersive soil that when you hit it with water, it just falls apart. That's a particular class. <laughs> but this kind of soil... But, you know, if you get it wet, it stays together, or if you drop it in water, it starts to fall apart. So generally, a soil health practitioner, practitioner will say these are unhealthy soils because they are unable to maintain their structure when wet, right? There are a few caveats which I'm sure people will point out. Now, identifying with your eyes what is a healthy or unhealthy state, generally people will converge. Okay, it's not a good idea if your soil falls apart when it gets wet. Right? But try to back that up with hard numbers in variables, and you end up with this very interesting rabbit hole of trying to define what is health. It's far easier to define what is unhealthy or non functioning soil than it is to say this is a state of health. My opinion. So, the European Union Soil Mission Board for Soil Health and Food Objectives proposed eight indicators that can indicate health. 
They gave no guidance how to compile them to make health. That's one of the outcomes of the project, to indicate health or not. But they've basically said, OK, presence of soil pollutants, note here, excess nutrients. It's not a pollutant, it's just excess nutrient. Salts, OK, indicated. You just so kind of polluted, right? Your soil structure, bulk density and absence of sealing and erosion, right? Physicality of the soil, and is it staying in a place? Carbon stocks, which everyone gets excited about. Biodiversity, another fun one. Uh, nutrients and acidity. Vegetation cover. Landscape heterogeneity. And forest cover. So these are fairly diverse indicators. And one of the outputs of this project is supposed to uh, suggest a unified soil health index at the European scale. This to me personally sounded a little bit like a fool's errand because if you've ever hung out with soil scientists, they do nothing better than argue about what is what and how to define things. So to me, it's an endless argument. So we kind of took the approach, okay, we've got to develop one anyway, but let's make it so that many could be developed if they wanted. Perhaps there's a specific one for a specific area that is useful. Let it come. Maybe we don't develop it, but let others develop it in the future. So that was our approach. And um, hands up if you, th oh, it's a bad quality image on the projection. Anyway, if you can see this closer and you're a soil person, I love that we can get so many caring photos of soil now. There was nothing five years ago, no one cared. Um, if you could see it closer up, you could see this isn't soil at all. It's potting mix. So it's slightly co uh, composted like bark and ground up organic matter. I love how often they put these photos up. And then they also usually put like a thing of basil. They stick it in there like it's a real plant, just at the top. And I'm like, that's not what basil looks like. So there's a real communication issue going on as well. And there's a whole work package about dissemination and communication about soil. Because we find out people don't know that much about it, which for me, how could you not know? But yeah, not, not a regular person. So we have to support the upcoming soil health law. So if you know anything about regulation in Europe uh, in regards to the environment, then you would know that air and uh, water are quite heavily regulated, but soil is not. You can just pollute it how you like, basically. So, well, it varies country to country. Part of the purpose of this law is to unify protection. So um, it's been quite the process if you've been following it. So uh, it's upcoming. The next step is commission adoption. We're really curious to see what goes in there. I don't know what it's going to say. It's been intense, amazing lobbying that I've not been a part of, but it's been fun to watch. So we'll see. Hopefully it's really strong. The other thing we need to do is contribute to the EU Soil Observatory. So this is an EU-wide, uh, I guess, yeah, observatory group body. Um, they need to be able to collect assured or quality assured soil information to track and assess progress in the EU. So they need to be able to report, essentially, by 2030, are we going towards our goals as a union in regards to soil? Okay? So we need to also support that. So some of the legislative compliance around this, it's pretty dense. Um, so we have to deal with um, so privacy concerns, right? So EU GDPR, because we're dealing with both points from farmers, right? So there is locational privacy involved, which people would be familiar with. Um, but then there's also some, there's also concern in regards to some of the variables you're tracking. So some of the soil pollutants, the heavy metals, etc. These can have really drastic uh, impact on land valuations and things like this. So that's also very sensitive. Also, flags off in here, protection from bias, but then also in the Artificial Intelligence Act, we flagged like, at the moment, as we can read, we flag as high risk. We'll see. Um, but instead of going, oof, we want to avoid it, we went, okay, let's lean in and see how we can comply with best practice, right? If we're in a different place, say if we're in the US, we could do whatever we want, but we're in the EU. We need to follow these rules. 
Um, and the other one is the EU Data Governance Act. I confess I haven't read it because it's, it's heavy and I'm not there yet. Projects just started. So it's basically to increase trust in data sharing. So on one hand, we have to protect the individual rights and privacy. We have to increase trust in data sharing of people giving us points to do these processes. And we also have to protect them from bias from the decision aids or the narrow AI out the other end. Huh. It's, 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 it's fun, fun four years ahead. So what are our solutions thus far, at least from a technological point of view, for the machine learning, open, reproducible, transparent, right? That the methods, example training sets, and that we use permissive licenses for maps, okay? So that at least whatever we do, it can be interrogated and looked at and other people can examine it because there's no way we can have a perfect answer to all of these things I listed in the last few slides. And then try to comply with EU legislation as in try to actively comply instead of avoid. Um, and then from the narrow AI point of view, the decision making on top of a decision support open, reproducible, and transparent. Where do you put the thresholds between your different traffic lights if you're going to do that? How is that decided? You know, to be really transparent how that suggestion that is there to support your decision is come to. Um, that we really look at how we can embed the uncertainty of the products into the decision support to actively use that information and um, to connect humans and experts to actually make the decisions, right? If you can satisfy an expert, like a soil expert that have been in the field for 50 years or 60 years, if, if you can give them things that they can interact with and input and make it better, maybe we're onto something. And then expose the APIs for further narrow AI development, right? We can't be responsible for what other people make on those APIs, but we can definitely be sure that we embed things like uncertainty, et cetera, and be very clear in what, um, what has been done to come to that data. Okay, so we're trying to teach the machine the experts from the past, right? So I know that we spend so much time in here, and this is kind of trying to get the mental models we have in our mind and kind of replicate the process and make them more powerful and able to cover more areas, but you still need this person who can actually make uh, a decision, take the aid and look at it and go, okay, based on this and what I see, this is the right way to go, okay? So work package structure, fairly complicated, but the most important thing is my last slide. Up here we have the physical environment, okay? So it's everything from space down to genes, which will be fun. Um, so we need to uh, both be able to track the scores, provide services to um, help change them, essentially, to monitor what's going on and optimize processes, right? So go around here. And then on the digital side, all right, we have this usual loop. But the two that are most interesting for me is the policy engagement, science policy engagement, and soil health methodology and standards. And that's what this is for, because it's going to be a very entertaining process, putting, I think the technologists will be over here and go, we'll build whatever you want, but then you'll have the soil scientists and the policy people, they all argue a lot, and imagine putting them all in a room. So, this, this is me. It's, it's going to be great. Um, that's it. I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this nice uh, presentation. Um, okay, are there any questions? Are there any questions from, um, from the audience? I look the soil scientist. <laughs> okay, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yes. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for the uh, very interesting uh, talk. Um, actually, my question could be boring, a <laughs> technical no, one. Uh, for the soil health, so you said uh, there are several uh, points indicating the soil health needs, right? Yep. But in your uh, project that you didn't mention, did you mention the um, uh, soil indicators? Are they corresponding to this completely or is it different? And also in the Netherlands, there are uh, soil health indicators, I think it developed in Wageningen as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so Open how Bodum Index. Huh? Open Bodum Index. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
Indeed. So, so it's, could you comment on how uh, all, all these indicators will be uh, contributing to this uh, soil law? <laughs> <sighs> Well, we don't, we don't really know yet what's going to be in this old law. We know roughly, but we don't really know until it's out. Um, these are the, the indicators. Essentially, the projects were tasked to examine these, right? How they will be combined, hopefully in several different ways, and they will be tested against examples on the ground. Because I just don't believe that somebody can just come to this and say, this is the magical 42 that answers all our questions for everything. So hopefully many different ways and validate it. That's, that would be the short answer. I hope it's satisfying and not too boring. <laughs> okay. Yes, good. Thank any, you. any other questions? I have one quick question, sure. actually. Um, as far as I know, soil is, is a topic where actually there is a lot of international collaboration also led by FAO, and all, almost all the countries are involved. We have the global so soil maps and also for, for, for main layers. Um, but your, your, your project is focusing Europe. So my question is, how is the relation with the other international, um, let's say, in initiatives? And uh, what's the position of Europe from that point of view? So basically, do we have better examples where we have the soil health issues also um, studied with AI and machine learning methods in other countries or regions of, of the globe? Okay. Specifically, AI and AI for soil health is really not many, and I would say the country that's leading for soil health is America, is the US. So in terms of, like, we drew heavily from literature in the US in creation of this. Um, we have a different, you know, soil is soil, but here we are in a quite a, an interesting legislative and structured environment that we have to find a way to solve these issues within. I know the work package in soil health is going to be crazy and they'll be arguing till three in the morning on it. To me, it's more important that we can have probably a multiplicity of solutions that then can be looked at and assessed and go, okay, this fits our needs in this area, this doesn't, you know, uh, violate all these other principles we've put down, right, to allow multiple answers to be put forth and to have it judged by others and to allow others to build and develop on that. In regards to capacity building globally for countries and digital soil mapping, um, yeah, it's a very useful and important effort. It's often done in open source coding and I think that um, over time systems, yeah, uh, over time, systems will probably start to link up, right? And computing will start to be shared, but not before you can solve the issue of how do you how do you deal with these, what in Europe are legislative issues, privacy, you know, protection from bias, not advantaging other groups over other people for access to data. We have to solve those, and if they're sold and they will be, you know, published and shown and exposed, then. Hopefully that could set the stage for something that could grow larger than Europe. I don't know. So short answers, I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Just starting. So okay. yeah. Okay. Thank you very much yep. again for your presentation.